Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the previous lessons, we took some of the rulings pertaining to the chapter of Al Buyur, transactions, buying and selling. And we said that the base ruling when it comes to buying and selling is that it is permitted. And if anybody claims that a, a particular transaction is halal, then he is asked to bring the proof, however, with politeness. Or, as we studied, if the transaction contains al-gharar wal-jahala, which is an ambiguity or a probability, or zulm, oppression, any wrongdoing, or a riba then it is haram. And then we spoke about a particular issue pertaining to inheritance, and that is how or what are the rights upon the wealth of a deceased. And then we also spoke about the chapter of nikah regarding the proposal, and also arkan and nikah, the pillars of a nikah. And we also spoke about how to reconcile and solve marital problems. And after this, we come to the cultivation of children, the tarbi of children. So the first step is a parent or the parents looking at, them, their, at their own selves. If you want your children to be upright upon the religion, then you have to be the first role model. If the mother wears hijab, the daughter will wear hijab. If the father is always playing on his phone, the children will, always want, will also want to play on their phones. However, the, if the father is constantly looking at the mushaf and reciting from the mushaf, then the children will be like this. And also talking to your children and verbally emphasizing to them the, your aqeedah. Who created us? Say Allah created us. Who provides for us? Say Allah provides for us. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, he served the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in his household for 10 years. And Anas radiallahu anhu was young. And don't think that Anas radiallahu anhu, he never did anything wrong. However, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he never rebuked him. And he never said to him in something which he had done, why have you done this? Or something which he had left, why did he not do this? So consider the great and exemplary character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also the father has to be tolerant and patient over his children and not become angry for every small matter and especially patient in cultivating his child and educating them and verbally talking or teaching them about Islam and emphasizing Al-Islam. Who created us? Allah created us. Now, who provides for us? Allah provides for us. Who teaches us? Allah teaches us. And also the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, teaching and talking to your children about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so the young child grows up loving these matters. And also that you bring your child with you, such that he accompanies you in the masjid. But then when you are in the masjid. That you don't leave him to himself so he goes and plays and causes disruption, but you keep him with you so he prays with you. Then he prays next to you. And also, we have to order our children with the salah, especially when they are seven years old and older. And no. also, that in your houses, you have a small room or a portion of a room or a small corner, which is like the musalla of your house or the masjid of your house. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he used to encourage people to have masajid within their houses. And this doesn't mean the masjid where the congregation is held, but a small corner or a small room in which maybe there are some masahif, Quran, and you pray salah with your children and you talk to them about Islam. So for example, you have a lesson with your wife or with your children in this area of the house. And also that you make an abundancy of dua, like you say, oh Allah, grant for us from our offspring and our wives, those who will bring pleasure to our eyes and make them the a'imma of the people of taqwa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us that when the child of Adam, meaning when a human being passes away, all his actions cease except three matters, meaning three matters continue as if the reward continues. And from these three matters is a righteous child who you leave behind supplicating and making dua for you. And also knowledge which you leave behind which people benefit from. So for example in your situation, Allah has blessed you that you know the English language. 
and there are many ways for you to give da'wah in even other language. Some of you, you know more than only English. And even if you're a person and you're not proficient in translating, but you can take quotes from some good books, from trustworthy books, and then send them out and broadcast them. And also in the hadith, the third action is a sadaqa jariya. And what is a sadaqa jariya? That you buy a book or you buy a mushaf and you leave it somewhere for the sake of Allah for people to read. You leave it in a school or a masjid or a train stop, train station. And this is you leaving behind knowledge which people will benefit from until Yawm al -Qiyam. And also the digging of wells or the building of masajid. And if you're not able to build a full masjid, then having a portion in the building of a masjid. A Muslim has to have some efforts in every aspect, in every type of good action. Meaning, it's like shooting an arrow in every direction, towards every target. All the actions of goodness, try to have a, sh a small share in it. Like, for example, building a masjid, looking after the orphan, the digging of the wells, and spreading knowledge. And every great aspect of Islam, try to have a small action which is connected to each different area of Al-Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa said, the meaning of which is, O people of Islam, enter into Islam completely. Meaning all of Islam, try to fulfill and have a share of every part of Islam. And also the Prophet sallallahu, uh, also the author, Rahimullah, Shaykh Abdurrahman Nasr al-Si'idi, in his book, he also spoke about the chapter of a luqata which is stolen items or lost property, Afan lost property. So lost property of whose owner is not known, is unknown, then this is either an animal or something else. Um, if you think that the, there's a big probability, the major probability is that this item, it, it is not lost. For example, I'll give you an example. If we have somewhere yani outside uh, a skip in which rubbish is thrown and then by the side of the skip there is a chair and a computer and so the, some, other commitment, uh, some other equipment, then in the majority of the cases it's not lost property which has been left there but somebody has placed these items near the side of the skip because they don't need them. So this, there's no problem with a person taking it. So this, we understand in our society, by our own understanding, how we operate, that these items have been placed in that area by the owner because he has no problem with anybody picking them up and taking them. Now, and if this brother says that I exited from the masjid, and if he says that as I left the masjid, I found the Mercedes of Sheikh Ibrahim and it's ignited and everything's working and the AC is on and, and switched on. Is he allowed to take it? And he says, but there's nobody there. It's not allowed to take it. He's not allowed to take it. Why? Because we understand in our society how our society thinks that this hasn't been left there for people to take. Or if he exited from the masjid and at the door of the masjid there was a bike which had been left there, a bicycle. Now, in the majority of cases, the highest probability is, according to how our society works and thinks and our customs, that it is a person who has left his bike outside the masjid to come and enter and pray in the masjid, and then he's going to get his bike again. But if a person was walking on the street, and whilst he was walking on the street, he looked down and he found an iPhone 13, or a small amount of gold, or he found a computer on the street, or he found a watch, spectacles, Number a pen. One. So these types of items, in that, this type of scenario, this is what we call luqada. This is what the Sharia considers to be a lost item. Meaning, it's not as if the owner has placed the item randomly on the street without, or, or, or without a reasoning. Rather, most likely it's a lost item. So as I was walking and on the street I found this phone. Now, it's not permitted for me to touch the phone. It's not permitted for me to lift the phone without me thinking first. I have to first think that if I take this phone, will I be able to publicize or to announce it to the people for a whole year that there is a lost phone in my possession which somebody owns for a whole year? 
If I am able to do so, then it is so. However, if I am not able to do so, then I leave it or I inform the police, the authorities. So the ruling is, when it comes to lost property or lost items, that it's not al allowed for a person to take it into his possession un unless he knows that he's able to announce or advertise this lost item in that locality for a whole Hijri year. And this ruling which we mentioned, this applies to those items which have a value with the people. But there are other items which don't really have a value with the people. For example, if you found this pen on the street, it's not like the owner is going to be searching for this pen for a whole year because it has little value. Perhaps he'll search for it for a couple of minutes and then he will leave it. And this brother, he says, by Allah, I know people and they are extremely stingy. So much so that even if it was 10 pence and he had left that 10 pence by the side of the masjid, every day he's going to be asking for where the 10 pence is and he's going to approach the imam and say, Akhi, did you not find that 10 pence which I left at the side of the masjid? So how do we deal with this? That these rules apply according to the majority of the people. Because you find some individuals like Sheikh Ibrahim, for example, that even this phone, if he lost this phone, he wouldn't think about it for two minutes because it's of no value to him. So you find people on each side. So yeah. we have to, in these cases, we consider what is prominent amongst the people and the majority of the cases. So sometimes if you're walking on the street and you find items like, for example, this pen and this chocolate, and the value of both of these together is maybe a pound or even less than a pound. And it doesn't really have a value with the people. It's not like somebody's going to be searching for these items for a whole year. So if غلبت الظن, if the most likely scenario is that this is, has no real value with the people such that they're going to search for it, then a person can take it and eat from it straight away. So if a person says, okay, now at the stall, there's nobody there right now, and this item is there, I'll take it and eat it. And we reply to such an individual that our society and our practice, our custom is that we understand that these items have been placed there because they are pos at the possession of somebody and he is selling them. Even if there was no security guard or anything, but we understand according to how our society works and our customs that these are not lost items. And this you find in our place and even here, for example, some of the open markets that there will be a stall and there might be a cloth on the items. That cloth is an indicator that these items are the possessions of a particular person. So if you find an item and it doesn't really have any value with the people, and again we're talking about the average person out there, a pen or a chocolate or something like this, and it doesn't have real value that somebody's going to go out and search for it, then a person can take it. So if a person lost five pounds, would he be searching for the five pounds, the average person for a whole year? In our society, the customs of our society, would somebody search a whole year for five pounds? Perhaps for a minute or two or an hour, a couple of hours, somebody may search for it. So if you find this five pounds, now if a person found 50 pounds, now no. this is the highest value note in this country, the 50 pounds. Now the no. average person, if it's 50 pounds, He's going to be looking for his 50 pounds. Similarly, a phone or, or uh, a tablet. Tablet, the important thing. Yes, he's iPad. Or an iPad, a person is going to be searching for it. Now, such items which have a value for a person, the average person, and he's going to be searching for it. This, if you take it, you have to make it known, announce it or publicize it for a whole year. But it's not allowed for such lost items to be announced in the masjid that whoever's lost an iPhone 13 is in the office and go check out the office. So if a person enters into the masjid and says, has anybody from the students of knowledge here found my iPhone 13? Then it is legislated for you to say, La radhahu Allahi ilayk, that may Allah not return it back to you. Why? Because the masajid were not built to advertise lost items. But it's permitted for there to be a notice outside the masjid, for example. And it's just mentioned, uh, if somebody's lost a phone, come to the office. Without mentioning all the details. And then if somebody comes forward, you can ask that person, what type of phone was it? What color was it? What were the uh, characteristics of the phone? 
على كل حال if a person finds 50 pounds or a mobile phone or an iPad or something which is of value to the average person out there then he takes it and he has to make it known for a year if the owner comes forward and you can test if it's the right owner then you return it back to the owner and if the owner does not come forward after a year then you can take it into your possession and then the second type of items which are lost are animals Sheikh Ibrahim whilst he was walking from Leicester to London he found تأكل. a cow on the path and the cow was eating and he says can لا. I take it ننظر. is he allowed to take this animal we have to look so if the animal is in a place in which we know and we understand through how our society works and our customs that this animal is in a place in which most likely it is lost. So we consider this animal in this type of environment, environment to be lost, meaning either you're going to take it or somebody else is going to take it or it's going to be eaten by a wolf or it's going to die. This animal can be taken. However, if you know that these types of places are frequented by animals who come and they graze and then they themselves, they return back to the owner, then this is not a lost animal. So if that animal which you consider to be lost in this place, if it has the ability to survive and protect itself from small predators, like for example an, 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 a, a, a camel, a camel can walk and survive without water for a long time and can defend itself from some of the smaller predators like a wolf for example, then the camel is to be left. However, however if it is a cow or a sheep, and you know that the sheep or the cow cannot protect itself and is easily killed or hunted down by the predator, then that animal can be taken if you consider it to be lost. However, it has to be advertised or announced for a year so the owner can come forward. And all of this demonstrates, these guidelines and these laws, they demonstrate that Islam or the people of Islam are those people who are trustworthy. And they are not people who are treacherous and therefore fulfilling our trusts and safeguarding these trusts we do this due to our religion it's worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning we don't do this due to laws but we do th we do this because this is our religion whether there are cameras or there are no cameras it does not matter we still have to safeguard these trusts because it is our religion sometimes it occurs that the brother who had 50 pounds and he purchased something with 20 pounds, he should receive change of 30 pounds. And sometimes the shopkeeper makes a mistake and he gives him 40 pounds in change. If this brother, he went back to the shop and he said that you gave me the wrong change, you gave me 40 instead of giving me 30, perhaps that person will become a Muslim. A few years ago, there was an instance uh, there was a bus and you paid the conductor of the bus or the driver of the bus directly and a Yahudi he came onto the bus and the fare was one pound and in one pound and instead of giving one pound he gave the driver two pounds meaning double what he should have paid so the driver who was a Muslim he began to think should I return to him the extra euro or don't return to him is he going to ask is he not going to ask does he really care and when the Yahudi, when he wanted to descend and get off from the bus, just as he was about to get off from the bus, the driver called him, the Muslim driver, and said, Come, there's one euro that I owe you. And the Jewish man, he accepted Islam. So the driver said to him, Why did you accept Islam now? He said, Because I was searching for this trait of trustworthiness amongst the Muslims, and now I have found it in you. So the non-Muslims, they are looking at you and your behavior. And sometimes, Maybe a non-Muslim will rebuke a Muslim and say you're a Muslim and you're drinking alcohol and sometimes you have a non-Muslim who may rebuke a Muslim for not praying on time at work that you're a Muslim and you're not praying your prayers and I've heard there are certain instances where non-Muslims they want and they desire to live next door to Muslims and they don't want to live next door to non-Muslims why is this? they say because We've noticed that in the areas where the Muslims are residing, there aren't any ghosts. 
and also in the areas where the Muslims live. There's, you know, we're not irritated, we're not harmed. There isn't the raising of voices and music, loud music. And there are no disturbances. And they know from Muslims that Muslims don't drink alcohol. And if his neighbor was a non-Muslim and he'd be drinking alcohol and he comes at late at night and then he's going to cause an accident and cause damage. So those non-Muslims, they know this and they recognize this, and recognize this regarding the people of Islam. Meaning there's nothing now which prevents him from accepting Islam except one step. And maybe you're that step, you're that av avenue. Uh, and the author in his book Manhaj Salikin, he also mentioned the chapter of Jinayat. And Jinayat refers to transgressions, meaning crimes. That a person trans transgresses or violates another person by fighting or by injury or cutting or perhaps insulting him or swearing at him or making accusations against him, accusations of theft or accusations of kufr. And all of this, it comes under at taaddi violating the rights and transgression. And the non-Muslims as well, between us and them is an understanding of peace. And so it's not allowed for us to transgress against them and violate their rights. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how did he used to interact with the non-Muslim? With good, beautiful, exemplary manners. The pro uh, the, some of the ulama mention that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if he did not give any, if he did not preach to them in any way except that he dealt with them in these good manners, then these good manners would have been sufficient enough as a call to them. The slave girl, she is pouring the water for her master whilst the master is making wudu. And then the glass or the bottle, it fell from her hand onto the hand of her master and he was cut because of the glass. And now the slave girl, she becomes scared. And she says to her master, Oh my master, Allah mentions it in the Quran regarding those people who control and conceal their anger. And then yeah. he mentions that I'm controlling my anger, I will not become angry over. But she's still fearful that perhaps if he continues feeling the pain and the pain becomes worse, maybe he will punish her. And then she also said that not only do they conceal their anger, but they also pardon and forgive. So forgive me. And then he mentions, I've forgiven you as well. And then she reminds him, that Allah says, uh, the meaning of which is, and Allah loves those people who do good. And then he says, you are free. Ushtasana. So if you become angry, how should you react? What do you do? Firstly, seek refuge in Allah from a shaitan al rajim Secondly, perform wudu. If you're standing, sit down. Make dhikr of Allah, remember Allah. And don't remain in that place in which your anger will be uh, incited even further. And a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said to him, admonish me. And the Prophet وسلم, replied, La taghdab, do not become angry. Then the man said, advise me, admonish me. And the Prophet وسلم, replied, do not become angry. And the, and the man then once requested once more, advise me, admonish me. And the Prophet وسلم, repeated, do not become angry. And yeah. consider how small this advice was from the Prophet Sallallahu Just don't become angry. And then the Sahabi, the narrator of the hadith, he mentions that I realized afterwards that controlling your anger is the root of all goodness. So the Muslim does not transgress and violate other people through fighting or insulting or swearing. But at the same time, you don't allow a person to beat you or hurt you and you say no problem so no. don't do not allow anybody to transgress against you but at the same time you don't transgress against others and then after this the author rahimahullah he mentioned al-hudud and these are the penal punishments of islam and who is the one who establishes the punishments of Islam? is it for any and every person and so this isn't the right of any and every individual meaning a person kills another person and if he's asked why did you kill that person he will say well it was the had which I was establishing upon him and you no. hear in some of the countries killing and murder and if you ask them why they say well they're non-muslims so the only person who has the right to establish and carry out the punishments is the Sultan the, the state meaning the leader of the state otherwise this becomes play each one killing the other so the only person who has the exclusive right to establish or to carry out the punishments of Islam is either the state, yani the ruler of the state, or 
those who he has given the authority to do so, like, for example, the... Please, sir. Yes. 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 Yes.